at like the age of 18, I was just on the track. Go to a good college, get a decent degree, do good, you're gonna get an entry level job down on Wall Street, you're gonna work real hard, you're gonna be a broker, you're gonna make tons of money, you're gonna be retired by a you know, very young age, you're gonna have a house on the beach in New Jersey and a couple of Mercedes and a trophy wife, and that'll be the end of the game. I'm done, multimillionaire, that's it. I was playing professionally for the New Jersey Imperials. I was playing the best soccer of my life. I get offered this coaching job by one of my teammates to go coach at St. John's University. The NCAA Division I national champions are the best team in the country. I was having a blast. I was loving coaching. I was loving playing. I'm at living in New York. I'm also studying stuff that I really enjoy. I'm digging into like studying theology for the first time in my life in a formal way. I get online, I start doing searches about Nike and sweatshops and labor practices. And what I found was if you wanted to pick a company that completely violates everything that Catholic social teaching is about, Nike would be your perfect case study. And at the same time I'm doing this research, St. John's University Athletic Department starts to negotiate a $3.5 million endorsement deal with Nike that would require me as a coach to wear and promote the products. St. John's University got the largest Catholic institution in the country, coupling itself with the largest sportswear company in the world. And I said, how can we, as such a, a public symbol of Catholicism, do something that runs completely counter to our mission? Like we're saying to the world then, look, you should care about the poor and we should fight against injustice and we should seek out the causes of poverty. Well, unless you're getting like some really good athletic equipment and $3.5 million along with it. I mean, you wanna talk about just hypocrisy manifested in the real world, like this was it. I was given an ultimatum by my head coach, wear Nike and drop this issue or resign. End of story. So in June of 1998, I was constructively fired. People were telling me, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, those are great jobs and you can live like a king or queen in those wages. And those people are really happy to have those jobs. I want to go find out. Doesn't everybody just want to know the truth? So I wanted to know the truth firsthand. I wanted to see it. I wanted to smell it. I wanted to hold it in my hand. I knew I was going to need other people. Leslie was a natural match. Jim and I went to college together. We came together ultimately because we share a, an interest in labor rights issues. I eventually met back up with her a few years after school through an email about sweatshops. I really wanted to be working with these issues. And I wrote to my buddy and said, you know, who's this woman that's writing to you about this stuff? And he said, oh, she's nuts like you. You know, you should email her. And she was actually en route to go work with Mother Teresa's sisters in India. And I sent her off this email. Hey, I got this great idea. Let's go starve on Nike's wages in Indonesia. And so he's like, I, I really need to go. And she wrote me back. Sounds great. Let's go. We plopped down in Tangerang, Indonesia, this industrial suburb outside of the capital of Jakarta, with the plans that for the next month, we were going to live as Nike's factory workers lived, which meant that we were gonna go live in a worker's slum outside of the capital. And we were gonna live on the workers' wages, $1.25 a day for the next month, to try and come maybe to a better understanding of what it's like for Nike factory workers to make this kind of money and live under these conditions. We lived in a nine by nine cement box. Uh, it was over 100 degrees, it's 100% humidity, a small window, certainly no air conditioning. No furniture. You slept on a very thin mat on an uneven cement floor covered in shelf paper. The streets outside of your home are lined by open sewers. And what that means, like in the rainy season, you would have all that feces just float up into the streets and into your house. And every time that you go to the bathroom, it comes back out into the sewer for everybody else to see and smell. You would have football sized rats that would stampede over the ceiling at night and come up through the toilet and look for stuff to eat in the house. 
um, or the fist-sized cockroaches that would crawl over you at night. Just like anyone around the world, you can't just drop into someone's life and be like, hi, we're here, we want to live in your life and tell us how much it sucks. Uh, you had to build bonds of trust. We would go to you know, different workers' homes. You got like four women sleeping in like an eight by eight cement box like, and all their possessions are in there. Like everything in this small area. $1.25 a day after you've paid for your rent, water, electricity, any major transportation costs, you're gonna be left on average with roughly 7,000 rupee per day. What the hell does that mean? That's gonna buy you two simple meals of rice and vegetables, a bag of peanuts, a bottle of iced tea, and some dish detergent. And that's all you can get. And that's your reward. I lost 25 pounds living on Nike's wages in Indonesia. Um, I spent the month painfully hungry and tired and like near the point of exhaustion most days. They will be working overtime hours just to get by because they can't possibly get by on the wage that they're paid without working incredible amounts of overtime. I'm walking down this dirt path into this village and I see this massive pile of scrap shoe rubber that I later learned came from one of Nike's factories and piles like that get dumped there all the time and the end result of these piles is that they get burned in that village in the big open space where kids play and the burning fumes I learned from the company that designs Nike shoe rubber will give off toxins and carcinogens. Kids are paying the price and they're the ones with the chest infections and they're the ones that are going to develop cancer. When we were in Indonesia, we made attempts to get into a Nike factory because Nike claims on their website we have nothing to hide. I'm Mike. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Good. Okay. We went over to Nike's corporate offices and Nike denied us that. We were unable to accommodate their request. <laughs> Yeah, so long. So yeah. you know, certainly management of the factory didn't want us to be there and it was kind of frightening because we several times tried to get into the factory. We weren't out of the van for more than three minutes and there was security like surrounding us and then the factory managers came out. What's going on? We're outside a uh, Nike shoe factory right now. Security's kind of surrounded us. The local mafia certainly works in conjunction with these factory bosses. The factory bosses are, some of them are just brutal, ruthless, hired muscle to keep workers in line. And we met with one worker, Giulianto. He told us because he was union organized and he was trying to form an independent union. He was threatened at gunpoint. I think that the majority of workers are saying, look, we don't want, we don't want you to pull out the jobs. We want to work. We like to work, you know, we want to make the, the shoes. We were proud of what we do, but uh, we don't want to be exploited. Like, why can't you just let us meet our basic needs? We're talking about food, clothing, housing, healthcare, education, being able to take care of your kids and some modest savings. Okay, so we're on Nike's campus right now. It's a little bit different than the factories in Indonesia, just a tiny bit. The CEO of Nike, or Michael Jordan, or Tiger Woods, or Mia Hamm, or any of the other people that are really making a lot of money because of the way that Nike does things, should care about these workers because they're human beings. When I see people like Tiger Woods get $100 million just for wearing the clothes, we're saying as a society, like this one individual, because they play golf well, is worth more than 700,000 people. Nike is in Indonesia for one reason, cheap labor. It's an ideology of maximizing profit at all costs to humanity and nature. And it's all, it's this entire, like a vicious cycle that starts with the heads of the corporations that want to make a great return on shareholders' investment. Some people say, well, hey, that's the way things are. That's the American way. It's capitalism. That's the American way. No, the American way is democracy. That's what our country was founded on, a belief that all people are equal, that there should be a respect for democracy, for human rights, and for the protection of human life. That's what we're about as Americans. Something's wrong here, and we can fix it. It's a necessity. The tipping point is now. At this point in our history, we need a story like this to be told.